Welcome to the FinTech One-on-One Podcast, episode number 342. This is your host, Peter Renton, chairman and co-founder of Lend at FinTech. Before we get started, I want to talk about the 10th annual Lend at FinTech USA event. We are so excited to be back in the financial capital of the world, New York City, in person on May 25th and 26th. It feels like fintech is on fire right now with so much change happening, and we will be distilling all that for you at New York's biggest fintech event of the year. We have our best lineup of keynote speakers ever with leaders from many of the most successful fintechs and incumbent banks. This is shaping up to be our biggest event ever as sponsorship support is off the charts. You know you need to be there, so find out more and register at lendit.com. Today on the show, I'm delighted to welcome Greg Wright. He is the Chief Product Officer at the Experian Credit Bureau, and uh, he's here to talk about a new product, the new Buy Now, Pay Later Bureau that Experian has just recently announced. Wanted to get Greg on the show to really dig into this because it's a really innovative product. It's something that I think is desperately needed, and we do go into some depth into how it works and uh, what's in it for the buy now pay later platforms what's in it for consumers and how it interfaces with other offerings they've had they also we also talk about Experian Go which is another new product from Experian where people can sort of create their own credit file and and how that interfaces with Experian Boost and uh, and everything else it was a fascinating episode hope you enjoy the show welcome to the podcast Greg Thank you, Peter. Glad to be here. Okay, so let's get started by giving the listeners a little bit of background about yourself and just tell us some of the highlights of your career to date. I'm Greg Wright. I'm the Chief Product Officer for the Credit Bureau for Experian. I've been with Experian now for over five years. I do have a ton of background in technology. I spent eight years at Intuit up in the Bay Area working on products like QuickBooks and Mint.com and Quicken. I spent a little bit of time in the insure tech space. Before that in my career, I have a little bit more of a varied background. I actually have a law degree. I worked for some startups back in the day, eToys, notably down in Los Angeles. And I spent five years at the Boston Consulting Group. Okay. Yeah, you know, talking about buy now, pay later, it's still a very hot topic. Obviously, we have a variety of different players. So can you just sort of take us through the BNPO landscape today and the different types of offerings we have? Yeah, it is a very dynamic space. And looking back pre-pandemic, we were already seeing very high growth rates in the buy now, pay later space, a different emerging type of shopping behavior by consumers and how are they are buying things through digital e-commerce channels and really the emergence of the buy now, pay later product. And through the pandemic, that's only accelerated. A lot more people at home, I think, on their computers buying things through e-commerce and digitally has kind of lit that whole consumer shopping trend on fire. The other interesting thing about the buy now, pay later space is many of the players have come from all over the world. Right. And this has really struck a chord with consumers, uh, whether it's from Australia or Sweden or here in the US. And the growth and spread of buy now, pay later is a shopping behavior and a vehicle for enabling e-commerce has really, again, did not start necessarily in the US, but has been really a global phenomenon. And that growth we see pretty uniformly across all our major markets. So it's a very exciting space. Indeed. And I really do appreciate some of my fellow countrymen, my homeland of Australia, that have led the way uh, when it comes to buy now, pay later. So then why do you think beyond just the sort of people sitting at their computers or whatever, is there something specific that you can touch on that really has driven so much growth just in the last couple of years? Let's talk about that. I mean, I think it's a new consumer value proposition that has really struck home with consumers. Through the e-commerce shopping experience, they've made it very easy and convenient to have a new payment ability within the shopping cart. It's a way to budget your expenses for something that you want to buy now, but you want to basically know that you have, in some cases, in a pay in four model, you have four equal payments that you're going to pay for that purchase. So you can kind of think about how you're going to budget for it. The way the buy now, pay later products are set up with their merchants is The merchants actually pay a fee to the buy now, pay later lender. And so that's because they see higher conversion rates in their shopping carts. They see larger shopping carts being converted. But that value 
creation through the merchant to the buy now pay later means that the buy now pay later clients also can have very attractive terms. In fact, most of them are zero percent interest. That kind of combination of being able to plan your purchase out without necessarily having to pay interest on it is a very unique value proposition for consumers and one that's been very attractive. There are many different types of versions of buy now pay later. I think the traditional, traditional, if you can even use that term here, buy now pay later is a paying for model. You pay 25% upfront and then you have three equal payments over the next six weeks to complete the purchase of that or repay that loan. But there's other flavors of it from point of sale lending that might have 12 month terms or three month terms. Um, again, oftentimes you see a 0% interest rate, but sometimes you do see some percent interest rates depending on the type of loan and what they're buying and what that buy now pay later is offering. Uh, and when you look at each of the different players, they all started off in their own space with a certain type of product and a certain maybe niche e commerce starting point. But as they have grown, they've diversified what types of products they have and what kind of spaces they're playing in. And we continue to see that evolution even as we watch the market grow. Are there certain segments that are growing faster than others? One that maybe was a starting point and has continued to see very high growth is in the apparel space. So a lot of these retailers have focused on apparel. Obviously, you know, there's the high-end exercise equipment or now branching into even vacation adventure type packages, you know, an area where we may see even further growth is maybe even in travel and flight. And then in other spaces, maybe more like elective medical care or veterinary type services. So you'd see a very diverse set of products and services and categories where by now pay later has extended um, even one going farther afield. Some are even now looking into kind of B2B payments that could right. be fueled by buy now, pay later. So I'm really curious to see where that goes as well. Yeah, that's a topic for another day, but yes. it is, uh, that is interesting. So then what would you say are the biggest issues facing the buy now, pay later industry right now? I know talking with these clients, they are laser focused on continued growth. I mean, that's what they have to continue to do. And that does mean broadening their product portfolios and, and what types of consumers they serve and, and what types of different product areas that they have to grow into. But what comes with growth, especially with any type of new lending product, is a broader, more mature portfolio, which always introduces a change in how they have to manage risk and how they have to manage delinquencies and other things that may start to come into a broader, larger consumer lending portfolio. And so I think that's one of the areas that they're having to tackle right now. You've seen that written about quite a bit that people get in over their head. Do you feel like the increased delinquencies, like what's your take? Is this a major problem the industry has to address? I think it's a natural evolution of any maturing broader lending marketplace for any type of product here. I think the delinquencies still remain below that of most other categories of lending, mm -hmm. but it also means that they can't ignore the problem. And this is a very typical evolution of worrying first about fraud and, you know, identity and, you know, are these actual real people buying things to then now I have a portfolio of outstanding debt obligations that I have to manage. And some of those will turn into failure to pay. This is a very natural evolution of that. I don't think it's a defining problem for buy now, pay later. Okay, That's where we can help a lot as a bureau is coming in and really understanding risk, not only up front in the underwriting process in a seamless, easy way in the shopping cart, all the way to how you manage that portfolio over time. But you know, some of these platforms, they promote themselves as, you know, no impact on your credit, no credit check. Um, you can go and uh, just download the app and get, you know, $100, $200 of credit instantly that you can go and use with no credit checks. I mean, you know, should we change that? I mean, how should we be assessing the risk that comes along with with a no credit check type policy? Well, we'll see how the different clients tackle that. My point of view is that any of them that survive to get to a certain size will eventually want to be pulling credit. Now, there's a whole nother topic around how do you pull credit? How does that impact consumer credit scores? How do you do the right approach to reporting those outstanding loans and payment history against those loans? That's a whole nother topic we're going to dive into, Peter it's an eventuality that they will all need to pull credit data in the underwriting process among maybe other data associated into that credit decisioning. Right, right. Well, let's dig into that for a bit. One of the reasons we're getting you on today is that, you know, we had the big announcement that Experian are launching an entirely new type of credit, uh, I guess what you call it, a credit score or the buy now, pay later credit report. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing there. 
you've kind of given us some background about why it's necessary, but tell us a little bit about why you decided to create this new type of bureau. Looking into our history a little bit and then why we're going forward the way we're going, Experience been in the buy now, pay later space with our clients for over five years now, from the very you know beginning of the buy now, pay later movement, if you will. Um, and so we've been analyzing the data and the trade lines and working with our clients on that front for a while now. You maybe even have seen some media out there saying, oh, well, these, you know, there's a gap in reporting and transparency of these debt obligations because they don't report to credit bureaus. Well, we have millions and millions of these trade lines at Experian. And so we're very familiar with this data. We're familiar with how It works with other trade lines within the Bureau and how it works with conventional credit scores. And we've done a lot of deep analysis on this, which is why we chose to go the path we're going. Many of our clients who are in the buy now, pay later space have been reluctant to furnish data for some pretty real reasons. So let me just walk you through a little bit about how conventional credit scores view new trade lines Mm -hmm. and how buy now, pay later kind of breaks that model, if you will. So in a traditional world, you had a personal loan or a credit card. And let's just go with the credit card model. So you have a credit card and you want to go buy a few things on a Sunday afternoon, some shoes, go to another side, buy a t-shirt, maybe even make a larger purchase. Those would show up on that credit card as a transaction. You wouldn't even see it as part of the credit bureau. You would see the balance maybe increase in the next reporting cycle if if you didn't pay those um, those payments or those transactions off. It would not be a new trade line. It would not be a new inquiry on your credit report. And maybe you'd have a shift in utilization of that credit card, which would have a nominal impact on your credit score. Fast forward into today's world, if buy now, pay later, purchasing behavior and transactions retreated under traditional reporting rules or approaches, every time you bought something, you'd have a new hard inquiry on your credit report. You would have a new finance trade line on your credit report when it was reported, and it would have 100% utilization because it funded just the purchase of that shopping cart. And there's no other additional line of credit associated with that. And if you went shopping on a normal Sunday and bought three or four or five different things, what would look like normal shopping behavior on a credit card looks like really risky behavior under a, a traditional reporting for buy now, pay later, because there are five different trade lines, five different inquiries. It looks like you're seeking credit in a fairly risky way and then maxing out each of those trade lines as you get them. Traditional credit scores look at that and say, something's going on, something is very risky going on here. But the reality is we see a lot of buy now, pay later consumers do multiple purchases and sometimes even multiple purchases within a year or within a month. And that can have real implications to consumer credit scores. Even one new buy now, pay later with positive payment history can have an impact on a consumer score negatively. When you start to add three, four, five of those, that compounds very, very quickly. So the way we've seen our analytics means that that doesn't really work under traditional reporting approaches. Now let's talk about the overall principles of what we're trying to accomplish for our consumers, for our lenders, and for the industry. We want to encourage and support and enable a new shopping behavior, which is the buy now, pay later trend. It's a convenient, easy way for consumers to plan for their purchases. And and it's a very popular way of buying things online now. And we want to do that in a way that is safe for consumers. We want to create consumer harm on conventional credit scores just because they're going out and shopping and that you would not see the similar impact if they just pulled out their credit card to do the same thing. Secondly, though, we want to make sure there is 100% transparency of debt obligation across the entire industry. And that includes traditional credit lines like a credit card or auto or mortgage payments. But we also want to be able to see buy now, pay later and have that accessible and easily understood by not only buy now, pay later clients, and and even if it's not their trade lines or their, their loans, that they can assess that when that time of maybe underwriting another buy now, pay later purchase, but for all types of lenders and all types of lending products. Right. Right. And then finally, in the long run, if you do pay your bills and your buy now, pay later loans back on time, how do we actually help consumers build credit with that as well? You know, the buy now, pay later operators, they don't want to furnish anything to credit bureaus because they know that it could negatively impact scores when in actual fact, it's purchase behavior. It's not lending like traditionally thought of. So it does bring up a question though. 
We have a file at the credit bureau. You know, we can obviously in- inquire on that and we can find out what our score is and get it download our credit report. But how is this new type of this buy now, pay later bureau, how is that interfacing with the traditional bureau? We're working with basically all the buy now, pay later clients you would be able to name quickly. We're working with all of them and working through how will this buy now, pay later specialty bureau work. Let me just maybe lay out a couple of the approaches. So we would work with clients directly. We would identify products that they have that look and feel like a buy now, pay later point of sale loan or lending product. So typically it's you know, used at point of sale. It's maybe paying for, maybe it has a term of three months or 12 months, but we would work with each client to figure out the most appropriate, responsible way to furnish data to experience. In many cases, that would be to our new buy now, pay later specialty bureau. Those trade lines would have an inquiry into the specialty bureau. It would have a full trade line reporting. It would be a real time bureau. So we're not waiting 30 or 40 days to have that data reported to us, by which time with a paying for that may be already paid back in full. We would have real time reporting capabilities. So when you're buying it in the, and selecting a buy now, pay later purchase option, that would be reported into our real time bureau. And you would have that depth of being able to see all the different transactions on a buy now, pay later consumer report. With being a consumer reporting agency as a specialty bureau, it would also come with all the consumer protections and requirements that come under the FCRA. So a consumer will be able to understand what's on that report, be able to display it, dispute it, correct it, going through all of the same requirements that we have as a credit bureau with our other bureaus. On the back end of that, and this goes to the point of your question, Peter, we haven't figured out exactly analytically how to do this, but with the data and doing the analytics in the right way, pulling that data back out of the specialty bureau and reporting it back or, or promoting it, if you will, back to the core credit bureau. So what we call file one or what you, you know, if you went to experian.com and looked at your credit score and saw your Experian credit report, it would show up on that actual credit report. Now that won't be in real time. That may be over a period of time. Maybe it's after certain payments have been made or a certain period of time has elapsed, maybe a traditional reporting time period. We haven't worked out the details on that one, Peter, but I'm confident that we have a path there and that if you have multiple buy now, pay later transactions, even across different buy now, pay later clients, it won't negatively impact your score up front. It will create transparency through the buy now specialty bureau for all lenders. And then on the back end for consumers, we will be able to help them build credit with that positive payment history on their buy now, pay later loan obligations. Right, right. So would it be possible, I just want to be clear here, So, because you've got some of the buy now, pay later platforms have, I would consider to be term loans because they're like, they've got three-year loan for something that costs two and a half thousand dollars, for example, which seems a lot like a term loan. And then you've got the same platform offering pay in four. Are you going to sort of separate those out? I mean, how's that going to work? We don't think about who should report to the buy now, pay later, especially bureau by client to client. We think about a product by product. Okay. And this is an important point because it's not just your buy now, pay later startups and, and lending clients that we're, we're talking to. You know, if you're a traditional large financial institution who wants to get into the buy now, pay later space and you want to launch your own product, we're talking to them as well. And they would be considered as viable data furnishers to the specialty bureau if they had the right product type. At this point, Peter, it's evolving so fast that we don't have a bright line yellow box to say this is buy now pay later and this is not right now you know we're working through that with our clients you know what makes sense and why does it make sense and largely the way i think about it is the intent behind the buy now pay later specialty bureau is it's enabling a new shopping behavior that if not treated differently would negatively impact the consumer's credit scores because it's just transactions not actual new loans in every case if it was being used on a credit card, if, if you will. And so thinking through that, that is how we'll figure out, you know, with our clients, should they report to file one directly because of a certain way this loan works, or should they report as a buy now, pay later, especially your bureau? In the long run, or even medium term, Peter, it doesn't actually matter because at some point we'll bring that data back to the core credit bureau itself. Right. Right. Um, and so, you know, I get a lot of questions about, well, are they pulling your file one credit report? And if they are, why aren't they reporting to that credit bureau? And my answer is they will. (laughs) We will eventually get all this back to the core credit report. We just need to make sure we're driving real-time transparency for the data for all lenders. We have to make sure we're not killing somebody's credit score for just shopping on a Sunday. 
for consumers and that we help them build credit over the long run. Right, right. I want to switch a little bit to uh, talk about financial inclusion because something else that you guys just did since the start of the year, or at least announced publicly, was launch Experian Go, which I thought was super interesting and didn't get as much uh, press as, uh, as I expected. But you know, this is where basically consumers with no credit file can report some of the things they spend money on and sort of create their own file. So tell us a little bit about how that works and if there's any kind of interface, how would it kind of complement what you're doing with the Buy Now, Pay Later Bureau? Our motivation to help drive financial inclusion for our consumers and for our clients is, is so aligned with our mission as a company. I mean, Experian's mission is to be the Consumers Bureau, and this is one of the ways that we deliver on that. Experian Go is a very exciting, first of its kind in the industry, capability for a consumer to be empowered to contribute data to a bureau to, to go from credit invisible to credit visible for the first time. Mm-hmm. And we're really excited about creating that capability for consumers. We've already had over 15,000 people who've, you know, literally gone from credit visible to credit visible to scorable in, in minutes. And the way they do that today is if you went to experience.com a year ago and you didn't have a credit report, we would not be able to find you. And we'd say, sorry, we can't help you. Good luck. And now if you come to experience.com and we can't find your credit report, we, we take you through this new credit journey, which is called Experian Go. And through the authentication process and, and you take a picture of your government document, maybe a driver's license or a passport, um, you take a selfie so we know you're real and live. We have built a API into the SSA so we can do a real-time validation and verification of your SSN. And with that, we have enough information to know that you're a real person and we can create a credit report for you. Now, at that point, and this is a little bit of you know kind of credit jargon, but you have a header file at that point, right? It's just your name and, and your SSN and your date of birth and your information, but it, there's no trade lines. There's no credit cards or payment history or anything um, that our credit scores, conventional credit scores need to be able to make you scorable. And that's where Experian Boost comes in. So right after you go through Experian Go and create a credit report, you then can go into Experian Boost, connect your bank account, and then all the positive bill payment history for your cell phone or for your utilities or for your streaming services can then be added directly to your brand new credit report. And within minutes, you can become go from credit invisible to credit visible to scorable. And what we're seeing is people who go through that process end up on average being around a 665 FICO score, which makes you basically lendable. That you're, you're not prime or super prime at that point, but you're on your way. And in fact, as part of the experience, we have lenders who have credit products that are aimed at that new to credit, thin file, new consumer and so we can actually get you into your first credit product, again, all in that same user experience. Yeah, that to me was amazing to go from having no file to 665. Even a lot of the, the prime lenders, they'll, they'll have a cutoff at like 660 or you know, 640 or something. So you, as you say, they're basically in the system. And I would assume they would have come in at like a 550 or something and had to work their way up. But that's, uh, that is a really qu- quite an amazing stat. And that will largely depend on, you know, how many trade lines they can add through Boost. And so that'll be, you know, dependent on the consumer and what kind of data we can pull out of their their bank statement information to then add instantly to their credit report. And it does then also dovetail into the buy now, pay later space as well. As we were talking about before, you know, many of buy now, pay later users are new to credit. Maybe they don't even have a credit card. And this may be their first introduction to a lending product. Again, through that buy now, pay later specialty bureau, we will also then see an ability to come back to the core credit report and add those trade lines there and help them build credit over time on that front as well. Though, again, we were talking earlier about the growth and even the kind of increasing maturity of the buy now, pay later space. It's no longer the case that it's just the young and digital natives who are using buy now, pay later. It cuts across the entire credit spectrum. It cuts across all age groups. I think something like 80% of a buy now, pay later, consumers have a credit card and a debit card. So, you know, this is not purely a new to credit consumer journey, but where it is, we can definitely help on that front as well. Right, right, right. And so can we also get an update on Experian Boost? It's been, I think, two or three years since you launched. You know, we've, I think you guys had a Super Bowl ad with it, and, and I've still seen the ads even this month on TV. So can you give us an update there? I'm so proud to be a part of the team who brought Experian Boost to our consumers um, we now have over 8 million consumers who've connected their accounts and added trade lines to their 
credit reports. I think uh, we have a counter publicly available. I don't know what it's at right now, but we were north of a 50 million FICO points increased across the consumers who use Boost and something like $1.7 billion have been lent through our credit match marketplace for folks who went through Boost. So it's absolutely creating access to credit where before Boost may have been more limited. Um, And then combining that capability again with something like Experian Go, that is what creates that magical moment of being able to go from credit invisible to lendable, maybe even having your first credit card. We're so excited about the continued success and consumer awareness and engagement with Boost. And you're you're right. We're going to continue to drive awareness of that to uh, our consumers because we think it is really that much value. Mm -hmm. So are there any other ways that you're helping expand access to credit for consumers? Yeah. So a lot of the things that we have been talking about so far, like with Experian Go and Experian Boost... This is really enabling and empowering consumers to contribute data directly to their credit report and to make their credit profile more comprehensive of their actual financial behavior. There is a whole other angle to this. And, you know, as a bureau, this is probably a more natural fit to what we normally are doing, which is advanced analytics and bringing data to bear to a credit decision. But I think the big difference that we're pushing on now is looking beyond the core credit bureau for additional data that can help inform under an FCRA umbrella, improve and expand and and drive broader coverage of credit decisioning. And what I mean by that is helping drive financial inclusion through the analytics and the data that we can provide to our lenders. In these cases, and and there's a product we call Experian Lyft and Lyft Premium, where we've gone beyond the core credit bureau. We've looked at the trended credit bureau data, which is that bureau data over time, We combine that with our Alternative Financial Services Bureau, which is called Clarity Services, which is another large data set combined with positive public records data that we've partnered with with a third party through uh, LexisNexis. And the power of that combined with the advanced analytics. Advanced analytics can be very powerful just on core credit bureau data, but when you combine that looking across multiple data sets, then the AI ML models can really shine. And so with Experian Lyft, we can now score 96% of the U.S. population. And just to give you some metrics to compare that against, conventional credit scores that are widely used in the market can score about 81% of the U.S. population. Vantage score 4.0, which uses the advanced analytics and the trended data, but not the other data sets, can score around 89% of the U.S. population. And then with Experian Lyft, again, 96%. And when we're looking at client validations and through the door populations, that can be as high as 99 to 100% of people they have seen come through their door in the last year that we could have scored. And so it's a very powerful analytical tool for our lenders to drive financial inclusion while taking on less risk. Right, right. That's really interesting. We've certainly come a long way, it feels like, just in the last five years um, with all of this. And so maybe last question then. And as you're talking, I'm sort of wondering, is this, uh, so if we solve the financial inclusion problem, but I mean, what's your vision for the future here? Yeah, you know, this is definitely part of, I think what we have to get out there into the market is, again, this is not a problem we're going to go solve five years from now. This is a problem that is solvable now by empowering consumers to take action and make themselves visible and to contribute data directly to their credit report, as well as arming our clients with data and advanced analytics, and whether they want to take our own score or take the attributes and build their own custom score, all of the above is very possible. So I think the answer is the tools are here today. And if you really wanted to, as a lender, be able to score everybody, that is very doable right now. I think the responsibility of the financial services market and industry to really take that on and make that a reality, because There is no excuse now. No, this is not wait for a couple more years and hopefully we get there. These are tools that are available today. This is a problem that's solvable and we can only do it together by having everyone adopt these tools. Right. Well, that's a great play to end, uh, Greg. It was really, really a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much for coming on the show today. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for the time. You know, I feel like we've come a long way since I've been in this industry. Just a bit over 10 years now. And to the extent where Greg just said there that really... You know, this is really a solvable problem. Not even that, it's a solved problem because we have all the tools now. People just have to use them, 
Lenders need to use them. Consumers need to use them. If you want to be part of the credit system today, then you can be and you can be scored and you will be able to have access to credit. Now, obviously, there's still going to be subprime consumers. There's still going to be those that have really poor credit. But for the thin file, no file consumer that has sort of had this catch-22 where you can't get a good credit score unless you have credit and you need a good credit score to get credit, that catch-22 has been solved. That's what we're really talking about here. Now, I think this is just so interesting and, and it really, really does provide, I think, consumers with the ability to control their financial lives a little better. They will have access to credit when needed. Not only that, they'll have lower interest rates on the credit that they're actually seeking. So that is good news. Anyway, on that note, I will sign off. I very much appreciate you listening and I'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye. 